everyone. Uh, we're going to get started here uh, right on time. It's a welcome to session 3B, uh, comparing air quality data from satellite monitors and models. And so we'll um, have our speakers come up individually at first and hold your questions for the end. We'll have a, a panel discussion. So it's my pleasure to introduce um, Ted Russell, one of the HACAS PIs um, from Georgia Institute of Technology. And um, Ted, I'll let you introduce what you're talking about. Wonderful. So I am indeed going to uh, be talking about how we're integrating our the satellite observations with our modeling and some of our monitoring that we've been doing. And I'd like to particularly point out my uh, colleagues a uh, couple of the grad students, Nash and Ariana, and then uh, one of the uh, co-PIs with me who's in the audience, Jen Kaiser. Um, and this is some of the work we've been doing both as part of our core project, as well as our uh, Tiger teams and soon to be um, uh, some of the rapid response as well. And just a uh, quick for the funders, and you'll note that Philip 66 is also involved uh, in terms of just a company that's also benefiting from the integration of satellite observations from um, along with their the other sorts of activities that they do. So that's what we're doing is we're combining satellite observations, et cetera. And just so you can read the act, what we're doing faster than I can read it, but really, um, so our, our core has been looking at the impact of port activities on air quality and uh, vulnerable communities. So I'll be talking about that. Um, as part of one of the tire teams, we've also been looking at how you can you how you can interpret some of the uh, satellite observations with the air quality models, et cetera. Um, so that's that's really what's been driving this and facilitating this. So one of the first things we did as part of this was it was started actually under the uh, prior HACAS program, but it is very much evolved to this, this one, and we've been able to do some additional uh, activities, was uh, looking at the impact of the um, Atlanta airport and other sources around uh, the Atlanta area on air quality. And we've been doing this both from a modeling approach as well as uh, most recently using uh, the tropomi. And just so you can see is this is uh, the tropomi re uh, retrievals and this is CMAC. And you can see that there's some real, um, you know, there's, they, they looked very, very similar. And just to give you, to highlight and give you sort of perspective, um, these two things right there actually um, are two major power plants to, the, that one used to be one of the largest in the Southeast. Um, this is Atlanta itself. Right there is about the busiest uh, um, freeway in the Southeast, a few hundred thousand cars per day. Um, so it's really quite busy. And the other thing that really stands out on this is this is the Atlanta airport sitting right there. And when you look at this, you know, one of the, and this was really sort of, I think, strike, struck, um, the, the Georgia EPD, our local management agency, who, who brought it to, to our attention, just how striking this was and how important this might be to a, uh, an agency. And just, you know, it was very much the airport was lighting up. So what we did is we used uh, both the modeling as well as the, the, um, the retrievals to look at this, the impact of the airport on air quality. One of the first things that just since you always want to do this, is comparing the observations, the, the retrievals with CMAC. And you got pretty good uh, agreement, though you did see that the higher levels sort of were, there was a bias low uh, between trope OMI and, and, uh, and CMAC, and then at the lower levels, an opposite bias. One thing that the air quality model does that I think is very important, uh, good, they can now see the application, um, <laughs> is that by using sort of combining these two, we're able to look at ozone, sort of the maximum ozone impact of the airport, as well as uh, we, we also integrated the two to look at particulate matter impacts. Okay, so one of the, this, one of the things that brought up was that the tropomy VC, um, vertical column densities were low at high levels and high at low levels. And one of the questions was why? And so we looked at that and just, this is probably just one of the, the multiple reasons 
why this might be happening is, uh, and I was talking with Dan, Dan early this morning about the some of the other reasons what other people are looking at is that one of the problems with the models is that the NO2 to, to NOx ratios, particularly in the plumes, these dense plumes, from what we can tell, they're not right. The models are getting too much NO2, NO being converted to NO2. And what this is doing, it would look to um, explain at least part of the bias that you see in the low bias you see in terms of the uh, observations. That is, this is actually more of, a, from our analysis, part of that can be attributed to a modeling issue that is over, um, essentially over diffusing this plume too quickly. And so that can help explain that. And then we also looked at, uh, we were integrating some of the recent field measurements that can help explain the uh, opposite bias more regionally where you don't have lots of, lots of emissions. So if you take those two in account, you sort of get an improved agreement between the two. One thing you still see is that the airport, which is a high NOx emitter, still there's this bias because we haven't done anything to address that NO to NO2, potential NO to NO2 bias. Or it could be that, and this is very possible, is that we are underestimating the emissions from airports. And of course, that has very important um, policy concerns as well. So the, this is to bring out a couple of things. Is One, how you can use the the uh, satellite, satellite results to help sort of identify issues and potential emission inventories, uh, but also that getting this NO2 to NOx ratio, which is sort of a wonky thing, correct, could be very important for interpreting um, uh, satellite retrievals because it's not all NO2. And if you have an area that has a fair amount of NO, which are the high emitting areas, that could be important. So. Uh, the next thing that, and this was actually driven by NASA sort of saying, you know, have you looked at this? And so we decided to look at this was, if you recall last Christmas, uh, before Christmas, uh, when, you know, there was these uh, container ships just lining up to get into the Long Beach and Los Angeles port right there, they're starting to just sit out there and run engines, et cetera. Plus there was this increased port activity to get stuff off of the ships. And the question came, how much of the, uh, how much impact would these additional port emissions have on air quality? So what we did is again, we combined CMAC and Tropomi to look at this. Um, and so if you just look at the, the base fields, this is over the Los Angeles area. So essentially this domain, um, and actually, what, one of the things I should have pointed out, you may not be able to see it, but these are all sorts of ships that are lined up there waiting to go into the harbor. Um, they have since changed the, the regulations that these ships are supposed to hotel, which means sit off further offshore. Um, so pretty good um, comparison, but you still saw see some, uh, some differences between the two. And one of the questions was, is how much of the, the trope omi difference between years, and this was to look at the impact of the, um, the shipping on air quality, might be due to meteorology, it might be due to changes in emissions. And this is what you see here. And by, com again, combining trope omi changes in, um, in the NO2 BCDs between 2021 and the average of 2018 and 2019, sort of looking, this would be the amount of change between sort of pre-COVID and post-COVID. Um, we were able to use CMAC to, to separate that into how much was due to a change of emissions and how much was a change of meteorology. And what you saw is that really most of the difference was a change of emissions. And it really happened sort of in the core of Los Angeles County. Um, but downwind of the port, so the port activities are sort of sitting right about there. You could see that indeed there was an increase in the NO2. Uh, one of what we're doing now is we're combining these results with um, measures of community vulnerability, which is what's shown here. These the red areas are more uh, vulnerable communities, and you can sort of see that some of these red areas map. Um, with where you see large changes in, in emissions. So that's the next thing we're doing is, is integrating the, um, 
community vulnerability with our trope only results. Um, and so just looking at future activities, we're going to be looking at some additional um, um, port activities, including the Los Angeles airport and maybe the Ontario airport in Los Angeles. We're also looking at other locations in the US that we might go to um, and combine them with, with demo, uh, community demographics. And then we're gonna also look at uh, Arizona fire uh, impacts. So that's where we're going with all of this. So thank you very much. Hey, thanks. Our next speaker on this panel is Alex Carabellas from the Northeast States for Coordinated Air Use Management. Will this work with the PDF? I don't think so. So you might have to tell me. Okay, <laughs> that's no problem. Mm -hmm. I think if you click this arrow to the right between the two panels. Oh, close this that one to the right. Close that, yeah. Okay, so then I might have to just ask you. Yes. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Alice Carabellis. I am at, from the Northeast States for Coordinated Air Use Management. I am a environmental analyst and photochemical modeler. Um, and so today I wanted to kind of take a 30,000 foot approach and talk about a bunch of different projects that we at NESCOM and some of our member states have our hands in. So the next slide. But first, who are we? So NESCOM is a regional nonprofit association of state air quality agencies across all of these states. We are also uh, responsible for the Ozone Transport Commission, which extends this a little bit further south, including uh, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and DC. Um, we were established in 1967 by state governors, so we are older than the EPA, um, and we provide technical and policy support for our state members uh, to address things related to their clean air and climate programs. Can you go to the next slide? So um, I've stuck this in here because I know often we think about how do people use satellite data? So NESCOM uses satellite data and our member states use satellite data in a lot of the ways that we already talk about. So thinking about how we evaluate, use it to evaluate air quality models, um, address and, under, and better understand localized pollution transport, uh, use satellite observations for monitoring changing chemistry regimes, thinking about formaldehyde and NOx ratios, um, assessing current emission inventories, and something that I think is really intriguing as we get into higher spatial and temporal resolution is identifying the sources that might be missing in our emission inventories. Uh, thank you, got a group. Um, <laughs> so uh, the first one I wanna talk about in a little bit of detail is um, using satellite observations uh, kind of in a near real time sense. So over the summer, there was this exceedance at this coastal New Jersey monitor um, you can see in the air now image on the upper left uh, that that site had an exceedance and the rest of the area um, was uh, in, in the moderate uh, range. Um, and so it was kind of puzzling. Why is this the case? So using data from Trobomi, we could see or you could kind of parse out between some of the missing cells that there was a. Um, a a kind of a wraparound pollution event from New York City that affected that coastal monitor. So in this way, we can leverage satellite observations to address and under, better understand these kind of strange instances. Move on. Some of you might be familiar with the Long Island Sound Tropospheric Ozone Study. Um, it was a collaborative uh, field campaign. Uh, lots of institutions and researchers and EPA, NOAA, um, NASA, lots of folks together um, to better understand why we have persistent elevated ozone concentrations in the New York City, Long Island Sound, and coastal Connecticut regions. Some of the data that came out of LISTOS included these um, high-resolution observations uh, from the airborne GCAS Tazo instrument. So thank you to Laura Judd uh, for providing this beautiful image um, and that we reference a lot. So what you can see here is this beautiful spatial graphic of uh, varying levels of tropospheric nitrogen dioxide columns. And if you squint, you might be able to see some of those arrows that are on this plot. Um, those are uh, pointing to isolated plumes of NO2 uh, vertical column uh, uh, densities. And we might, you know, we can figure out pretty easily what some of them are. So that one in the middle, that's JFK Airport. Um, but we can use this information to really try to dig into um, this, the key sources that are making that are contributing to these large plumes 
of NO2 in the region. In the next slide. Listo spawned a lot of uh, the temporary and more permanent sites across the region, um, as well as some field campaigns that are coming forward in 2023 that we're really looking forward to. Um, and one of those sites was this uh, VOC special monitoring site at Staten Island. It's that red dot labeled Gopos Field, if you can see that. Yeah, this one. Um, and this came up because uh, there were some elevated propylene observations from aircraft uh, kind of in this vicinity. And we know we knew that there was a propylene refinery in the area. And so we, uh, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation established this site to um, better identify the key sources that were contributing to VOCs in this region. One of the reasons that they picked this site specifically um, when there are PAMS monitors kind of in the vicinity um, was that the nearest PAMS monitor is in the Bronx. It's a little too far, mixes with uh, New York City pollution. So we really wanted to isolate what was going on nearby. And so this is courtesy of uh, Professor Jay Turner at Washington University in St. Louis. And he completed a VOC source apportionment and wind regression analysis to identify contributions of propylene, butane, and isopentane from key sources uh, in the vicinity of the Vogels field site. And you can see that um, some of these uh, sources are identified in these kind of in these boxes. We can see that there's traffic and there's some cake farms in the area um, that are contributing to these pollutants at this site. Um, but then we see this big spike in uh, uh, propylene for uh, co uh, collated with the um, the Bayway winds crossing over the Bayway refinery. Um, so this is just some other uh, useful information that our states can use when thinking about identifying sources, um, what that means for um, ozone pollution downwind, and uh, in introducing different regulatory policies related to either specific sources or more broadly VOC controls. So the next slide. Um, so kind of shifting just a little bit, um, have it, did it, did you put a sign up yet or no? Okay, we're good. <laughs> I'm just like, sometimes I just get hungry. Uh, so switching gears a little bit and talking about some of the modeling that we're doing. This is modeling that um, we performed for the Ozone Transport Commission, looking at high energy demand day uh, episodic modeling. And so when we say high energy demand day, we think about um, peaking electricity generating units and what that means for ozone concentrations in the region. Now this work was done uh, using CMAC at a 12 kilometer grid resolution. I'm also kind of replicating these studies with a couple of other um, uh, couple of other sensitivity simulations tossed in at a higher resolution, 1.33 kilometer domain, uh, just over the Listos region. And so thinking about you know, our interests in this, we are investigating what these sources might be contributing. So these highly localized sources, what they might be contributing to ozone uh, concentrations as a whole, and then the uh, prescribing some bounding scenarios where we're identifying uh, what these uh, what this sector could be contributing if we were to prioritize highest emitting units versus lowest emitting units versus the most operating units. And I really think think you know trying to tie this in with satellite observations, uh, getting back to that idea of when we have higher spatial and temporal resolution observations, this can come in really handy to make sure that we are uh, addressing these source, these types of sources in our emissions inventories, um, whether that's spatially or in magnitude. Um, next slide. Uh, and finally, thinking about this is some um, ongoing modeling work out of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, and what they're trying to apply are uh, reductions in anthropogenic emissions of either NOx or VOCs in growing geographic areas. And why this is kind of relevant to the satellite group is we can use our understanding of uh, formaldehyde and NOx ratios to understand changing chemistry. In the in this domain, and then use that information when we're um, establishing these studies. Uh, just you know, kind of running different sensitivity scenarios to see what changes can be introduced and how these major emission reduction strategies could affect uh, chemistry in the region. Next slide. Um, this is 
really just to kind of drive the discussion. So often um, when we're thinking of when our states are thinking about emissions controls, we're thinking about different ways to approach that. So some ways that might be are to control by mass. We have to consider the feasibility and the cost of the controls. Um, our states have to acknowledge that they have the ability to implement and enforce some things in particular. Uh, and especially for VOCs, we're really starting to think about um, how if we can target specific VOC sources based off of ozone production efficiency. Um, so I really wanted to kind of plug this in here because um, you can't just, you, you have to you can really think about uh, regulatory, poli regulatory policies in a kind of whole of approach uh, and thinking about the different ways that you can make these changes and introduce these changes into the system. Um, so yeah, hopefully this is going to maybe jog some discussion. Um, okay, and so just thank you to NYSERDA for supporting some of my modeling work. <laughs> Our next speaker is um, Doug Boyer from uh, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Thanks, Arlene. Um, yeah, so Doug Boyer, uh, TCEQ. I'm going to sort of do a similar talk to what Alex did there and just discuss really a couple research programs that we have. We're lucky to, to have some funds and be part of other uh, air quality research within the state of Texas. Um, and just discuss how we sort of incorporate that and how we expect you, or perhaps how ACAS can help us in other states uh, as well. Or not. <laughs> okay. Um, here's just an outline. I'll give you a little bit on, on TCQ and um, some of our challenges that, where we face those within the state and talk about those relevant uh, research projects and then uh, some of our future challenges. So I'll try again. Let's work backwards now. Okay, uh, TCQ, uh, it's a pretty large agency. It, it has to cover the whole state. Texas is big. We have uh, or had about 2,800 employees. And I was gonna talk more about exactly what we do, but I think I'll just say that um, we have a job opening uh, for a photochemical modeler. So if uh, anybody is interested in that, I think uh, please go to our website and check that out and, and we'll have uh, some data analysis positions uh, open as well. And so Texas is a, a varied state, it's very large and there's a lot of different places that you could consider living too. Um, and I'll talk about that in terms of uh, air quality challenges. Um, Texas has uh, a big coast and it has some very arid re regions, um, very forested areas up in the northeast. Uh, our precipitation goes from basically nothing to floods. And so all of this plus emission sources, um, very large urban areas, it, it makes for some air quality challenges. Um, and so on this map here are the, the different non-attainment areas for the criteria air pollutants. Um, our, our main urban areas have ozone challenges, which a lot of large urban areas in the country do. Um, and that includes Dallas, uh, Fort Worth area, Houston, San Antonio, and, and the El Paso area. Um, El Paso has a, a, a maintenance issue with PM10, um, and then we have some sulfur dioxide uh, not containment areas that we've been addressing as well. So, um, and that's across a, a really big area, and so I think that um, we have a lot of monitors to help us with this, but we can't measure everywhere. And so that's where some of this satellite and modeling data really comes in. Okay, so research in Texas. We have, um, like I said, we're, we're pretty lucky in that we have uh, some funds that, that are given, us, given to us and another program from the legislature. And so the first one is the Air Quality Research Program. And um, that's administered right now by the University of Texas at Austin. And you can see that the really they're there to support our state implementation plan and developing research to do that. And so a lot of their work has been in emission inventory development, model development, um, a lot of different uh, research studies uh, with unique measurement campaigns. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, sort of a, a mix of some of that. Uh, with one of their projects. Um, TCQ, we, we also have uh, funds and we, we do more of the applied science, applied research that has to meet sort of our requirements and our goals. And so as a state policy uh, organization, uh, we have requirements, state implementation plans, 
other things that we have to meet. So the, the research that we do is just a little bit more targeted in, into that. Um, so this is, I wanted to point out two sort of projects. And um, this morning, we sort of heard about the, and even this this panel here is about sort of the um, the trifecta of you have observations, you have satellite, you have models, and and basically this is a project that I think it really meets that. And um, Dan Goldberg's here, and and I can push all the detailed questions to him for sure. Um, but this one is is really getting into the quantifying some of these NOx emissions by sector using tropomi and. Um, we're lucky to have the Tracer AQ campaign that was talked about this morning in the Houston area, and then uh, adding modeling too with CAMEX. And so um, the really unique thing about this is taking this tropomi data and then the, the NASA GCAS data for NO2 and refining those down into this uh, really fine domain. And, and I, I wanted to point out the, the wharf CAMEX domain. Typically at TCEQ, when we do our modeling, we're getting down to a four kilometer resolution, maybe 1.3 at times when we have the resources and capabilities. Um, but the uniqueness of, of this project is that they're going to take that down to a, a 444 meter uh, domain uh, grid. And so now you have 81 uh, grid squares in there from what we had as our, our finest. And so once you do that, you can really start to look at some of those individual uh, sectors, really pointing out some of our roads, uh, the industrial sectors, even residential, and, and really refining or um, inferring more about what how important some of those sectors are. So um, on top of that, they're going to add this general additive model to CAMEX to try and uh, adjust the inventory so it can match what was observed with the GCAS in 2021. And so we have a lot of great data in terms of our emission inventory. You know, it's talked about electrical generating units have SEMS on them. Uh, we do a whole lot of work within the state to look at our, our point sources. Uh, we run moves ourselves uh, for um, our mobile sources, and we, we do a whole lot of work on that, but we're always looking to get um, anything better. And so if this can help us understand these sources and, and how well we can model them, it'll provide a better state implementation plan for us and that we can um, hopefully get, get the Houston area entertainment more efficiently. Another thing is this is really help, going to help us prepare for, for Tempo that's going to be launched. And, you know, we're starting to simulate the, the amount of uh, resolution that we're going to get from, from there. Um, okay. The next uh, trifecta here is uh, sort of reaching what we had heard about this morning in terms of uh, exceptional event um, type analyses, and then just really trying to understand the impact that we have in, in terms of biomass burning or, or smoke plumes. And so um, one of the, the things that we've said and others too, in terms of uh, we have all this great satellite measurement out there now is that um, we're not seeing uh, or, or measuring what's happening at the human level. And um, some of the criticisms that we've had in some of our exceptional event demonstrations, I think others is that, yeah, maybe there is smoke that's observed via satellite, um, but was that was that at the ground? Was that impacting the monitor and really making that an exceptional event? And so we're trying to to take that into account here and put some monitors throughout the state that can help us evaluate uh, the amount of brown and black carbon uh, that are out there. And so we have sites in uh, Houston. We had El Paso. We're going to add uh, the Dallas Fort Worth area hopefully uh, by the end of this year. And so um, we have that on the ground measurement. And then we've funded some other projects with AER recently to try and uh, take a look at that satellite imagery and see, can we get some more information out of those? And so one is uh, trying to track uh, specifically brown carbon. And so that biomass burning signature using its uh, unique uh, UV wavelength absorption um, and trying to understand where some of that is coming from. And then on top of that, they're incorporating some machine learning models to track smoke plumes from GOES imagery um, and developing some of uh, 
that for Tropalmy and hopefully for Tempo as well. And so what we hope to do is sort of combine all of these uh, things together to help us get a more informed picture of, of what's happening and how much is, is affecting the surface area. So um, that's our, our hope and goal. And we hope that uh, this community and ACAS can, can help us with that as well. So I'll end here with some future challenges that we sort of see upcoming. And you know, we've talked and heard a little bit about there, there could be a lower PM 2.5 standard coming. If, if that happens, there could be additional non-attainment areas, which brings uh, more uh, requirements for states and other groups. And so um, some of these uh, resources and these applications have become even more important there. Um, additional non-attainment areas that could be outside of PM uh, 2.5. There's been a, a sort of a proposal. It's not really a, an official proposal, but a thinking from EPA that in, in West Texas, um, parts of the Permian Basin could be uh, looped in for ozone non-attainment for part of New Mexico. Um, we don't have any monitors out there and there's not a whole lot of population. And so that's a, a very unique challenge that can sort of lead to some of the discussions that, that may happen tomorrow in terms of, of rural um, non-attainment or rural air quality. So, um, and then lastly, I'll just leave up there from some satellite data means, uh, you know, continuing for us to work on that vertical gradient component. Um, Alex and I just talked about trying to get more out of the speciation, the composition, um, that ozone production sensitivity component is becoming more important, I think, in trying to understand that in terms of is it VOC and or NOx? I don't want to say VOC or NOx, it can be both. So, thank you. Great, thanks. Our last speaker before our panel discussion is Randall Martin from Washington University of St. Louis. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to share with you our recent updates on satellite-derived PM 2.5 and some applications. And for some context, this work is motivated by the growing awareness of outdoor PM 2.5 as the leading environmental determinant of longevity, with millions of attributable deaths worldwide. Deaths that are valued by the OECD at a few percent of global GDP, trillions of dollars in projected to grow. And the inclusion of PM 2.5 into the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals requires a measurable indicator of progress. But nonetheless, vast areas around the world have grossly inadequate ground-based monitoring for exposure assessment, with most countries in the world having no operational PM 2.5 monitoring at all. To meet even a basic goal of one monitor per million inhabitants would require thousands of new monitors with immense costs and logistical challenges. And so it's these gaps that motivate alternative measures of PM 2.5 that build upon decades of innovation across the remote sensing community with increasingly accurate and precise information at increasingly fine resolution. And you're seeing here four different algorithms and instruments uh, from both the Terra and Aqua satellites. And all of these instruments and algorithms have strengths and weaknesses that vary with location and vary with time. So an overarching theme of our effort is to evaluate the quality of these different data sets versus the ground-based sunphotometer network of Aeronet that accurately measures aerosol optical depth from the ground. And I'm not sure where I should be pointing in order to switch the slides. Not working on this one. Um, uh, thank you. Um, yeah. And. This approach then allows for inversely weighting these different data sets by their relative errors to produce an overall composite monthly estimate of aerosol optical depth, an example of which you see here. A large part of this data comes from the MIAC retrieval algorithm, followed by deep blue and dark target algorithms. Then the next step is to relate this overall composite estimate of aerosol optical depth to ground level TPM 2.5. And for that purpose, we'll turn to a chemical transport model, GeosChem, to calculate the relationship between those two quantities. So accounting for sampling characteristics, accounting for vertical profile information, aerosol hygroscopicity, among others. And this enables relating the 
aerosol optical depth composite that you can see in panel A to the PM 2.5 data set that you see in panel C. And overall, that geophysical estimate exhibits a high degree of consistency with the ground-based measurements, explaining 80% of that variance. A subsequent statistical fusion can explain an additional 10% of that variance. Our ongoing work is motivated by the expected termination of both Terra and Aqua, upon which all of our prior data have relied. And to that end, we are turning to Veers, which was launched in 2011 and has been uh, giving excellent observations of solar backscatter that can inform or can be used for retrievals of aerosol optical depth. The two different retrieval products that are currently available for that entire time period are Veers Deep Blue and Veers Dark Target. The Deep Blue algorithm as implemented on Veers exhibits differences in its implementation from that on MODIS. So that does lead to some complication in the comparison. But I'm showing you here the implementation of Veers into the algorithm that I just described. Um, and the top panel is showing the satellite derived PM 2.5 same figure that you saw before, just a different color scale. Uh, the middle panel is showing the effect of adding in Veer's dark target and deep blue data into this data set. What you should see is in most regions of the world, those differences are really quite small. And that would be expected given the maturity of the retrieval algorithms and the inverse weighting of the aerosol optical depth by its errors with respect to Aeronet. Nonetheless, there are some differences that arise, especially in the uh, North Africa and Central Asia regions where there are few aerosol optical depth monitors to inform the error characteristics of the satellite retrievals. Um, regions that are also sparsely po populated in general, so they have relatively little effect on population weighted PM 2.5. The overall performance of that data set with respect to the ground based measurements remains similar in quality to what we saw earlier, an R squared around 0.9 and a slope around one. The bottom panel shows the effect of excluding all Terra and Aqua data. And doing so introduces larger differences. Most of that difference we believe is driven by the exclusion of MIAC as a retrieval algorithm from this data set composite. We believe that as MIAC is added to the VIRS um, data sets, uh, that these differences will diminish. Some residual differences also occur from both sampling characteristics between VIRS and um, MODIS, uh, as well as differences between the deep blue algorithm as implemented upon VIRS and MODIS. But nonetheless, the overall performance, again, versus ground-based measurements of PM2.5 remains very high with an R squared of, of 0.9 and uh, indicating an algorithm that is in place to sustain the record as we transition uh, away from Terra and Aqua to Veers. Now, switching gears, I'll turn to an application that we've been uh, working with colleagues here, Scott Wichenthal, Michael Brower, Rick Burnett, in motivated by the question of whether the current standards and guidelines for long-term exposure to PM2.5 are sufficient to protect human health. And here, this study used, um, examined the association of PM2.5 with health outcomes in one of the cleanest locations in the world, in Canada, for 7 million adults, and found a smooth shape to that exposure response function across both the US standard of 12 micrograms per cubic meter, extending down through the WHO guideline of five micrograms per cubic meter and becoming steep uh, for very low concentrations. And so this adds to the body of evidence about the association of PM2.5 at low or very low concentrations. And the implications for a health impact assessment are that the overall burden of disease associated with PM2.5 in clean countries could, like such as in North America or Northern Europe, uh, could be even larger than had been previously assumed. Um, and the benefits then of meeting a WHO guideline could be even greater than had been previously assumed. 
One other uh, study that, that I'd like to share with you is uh, here led by Daniel Odo um, and Luke Nibs at University of Sydney is examining the association of PM 2.5 with a respiratory infection in young children uh, at developing countries in much of the global south and finding an association um, of PM 2.5 res with respiratory infection, especially for very young children. And again, indicating the many ways in which long-term exposure to PM 2.5 is associated uh, with a variety of health endpoints. The last point I'll end with is that um, we are currently QA, QCing our satellite-derived PM 2.5 data for 2021. I expect to be able to release that within about a month and are preparing input data for a large number of those international assessments that rely upon those data. And with that, uh, let me leave you then with the uh, prospect of continuing the satellite-derived PM 2.5 record into the VIRS um, uh, satellite stream. And uh, thank you for your attention. We can get all our speakers to come up uh, for the panel. Okay, so this is going to open up um, the floor for questions for the panelists, discussion points. Questions primarily for Randall. Uh, do you have any idea what proportion of that PM 2.5 is mineral uh, origins off the surface crust, and how much of it is crystallization in the air? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and we obtained that the our my insight into that question from sensitivity simulations using this GS Chem model that would. Uh, um, examine the composition or quantify the composition of PM 2.5. And from those uh, model analyses that worldwide, the population weighted PM 2.5 is roughly 30%. In the United States, that number is closer to 10 to 20%, uh, maybe closer to 10% in a population weighted sense. Uh, that's that's from the GEOS Chem model. Other models may provide additional or different information. Here's a uh, a jump ball question to the whole table uh, regarding what the entire science is going to be dealing with in the future. Here, the end of modus and the the handing of the baton to Veers. Um, I come from the the operational weather forecasting point of view, and We've got to love veers, but it's missing water vapor channels. And MODIS has water vapor, and, and now we got to get along without that. I'm wondering, is that a concern for the community when it comes to observing, analyzing, and then modeling um, these factors? So if you're talking on the air quality modeling side, not so much so in this. We get that sort of information from met meteorological models themselves. And so that's that's where we're going to pick that up on the quality modeling side. In terms of how Randall actually would do the retrievals and using those retrievals in uh, estimating PM 2.5 globally, I'm not sure what yeah, that channel I, does. I, I'm not seeing a lot of implication for the activity that we specifically do. I can understand it has broader implications for other uh, applications, but uh, the retrievals uh, don't have a strong reliance upon that parameter. Yeah. I might just uh, come back with the, the haunting thought that the numerical models from which other models are then fed, they themselves are initialized with data from mm. MODIS or VIRS, and now losing MODIS mm -hmm. will have a downstream impact there. I don't know how much, though. And I, yeah, I, and this is talking totally out of ignorance. Too bad we don't have someone who is much less ignorant than I. Um, but if you look at, again, the meteorological model of models and the meteorological modeling, these are the weather forecasting models. So they themselves cannot 
I cannot imagine that that information is not being provided by some other domain, make it so the MET models have the appropriate information driving them. Having been on some panels, you know, that's many of the weather satellites are up there to provide exactly that so that they can drive the MET models. Then that information is what we digest in the air quality models. And I will tell you that actually, in terms of all the things that can go wrong when we look at a model evaluations, we actually do, in some ways, humidity is one of the things we do best. Um, there's all sorts of other things we don't, I won't tell you what they are. Uh, <laughs> I wish we did better on it. Thank you. Great, thank you. Nobody jumping with a question, maybe. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll ask next. I have a very basic question. Um, how do you choose which model to run? Because there's GeoS Chem versus CAMEX versus CMAC. I'm just wondering why do you choose which you use? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in first. Um, in terms of the what we have to do in, uh, for photochemical modeling uh, for, say, an ozone attainment demonstration uh, SIF, that we are required to use basically CMAC or CAMEX as that photochemical model. Um, we do use GeosChem to, to provide boundary conditions and things, but we, we have some requirements that we have to use based on EPA guidance. There can be other models that could help us inform uh, the results or, or provide us other inputs, but those we have to use. For other things, you're open, I guess. And I'll tell you, on our end, we use all three, and it's just, which is the one that actually has the appropriate attributes for the scientific question? Um, you know, in terms of, are we looking at more regional versus a global issue? Um, and it can even get down to what sort of, how it's been instrumented in terms of being able to assess how a single source impacts um, air quality or the inverse, you know, if you're doing an adjoint type model uh, application. So it's really, it's the science, for us, it's the scientific question. There have more of a regulatory uh, handcuff. Uh, my answer would be similar to Ted's, that it's motivated by a scientific question, that our work often is motivated by global scale phenomena that requires a global model. And then I appreciate the nimbleness of being able to modify that model uh, for um, both for a, a given application as well as feeding in that information into the standard version of the model and appreciate the community that is working on that model development uh, because their, their developments all feed into the skill of that model as well. And I'll just add a specific example is that the Ozone Transport Commission did a very large source apportionment analysis and the techniques and tools available were in the CAMEX model versus the CMAC model. And so then you have to make your decisions that way as well. So I'd like to ask a question, um, probably more for Doug and Alex, um, but Doug, you mentioned, and it got brought up earlier, that this um, possibility of a tighter uh, PM standard is going to have major implications for you. And so my question there is, like, do you see some like specific pain points and that places where a group like KCAS might be able to help? Or um, I guess I was just curious to hear a little more about what do you see as the challenges yeah, I think that, you know, the main challenge for us is that we have not had a, a PM 2.5 non-attainment area. And so that's certainly a, a, that would be a new thing if that challenge came to be. Um, the levels that we've heard talked about could bring in a lot of uh, urban areas uh, as non-attainment. Um, and so trying to bring more decisions to that, trying to understand what's the composition of that PM 2.5. Um, so how do we help improve the situation? And so I think that's that's the biggest thing. And so if there's ways that this group or others can help, help us define um, what that's made of, where it's coming, um, that can help the decision makers then figure out, okay, how, how do we solve this problem, I think. Alex, do you have? I actually think you described what I would okay. what I would want as well. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Thomas. Um, thank you. 
Um, I actually have a question for Dr. Randall Martin. So for the uncertainty or the uncertainty raised across different data sets for PM 2.5, you mentioned that because there's a scarce, scarce um, measurement from the ground from like places like Africa or places where people less like a smaller population are living. I wonder if we rely, start to rely more on the satellite, especially when Maya becomes available over those sites. Do you see any challenges raising, like if we rely too much on the satellite because we don't have surface measurement? Do you have like any thoughts on that regard? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And it's challenging to identify how to assess the uncertainty of the satellite observations themselves and how to translate that measure of uncertainty at a point to a given location without, without observations. So uh, I have, um, I guess the, the idea of relying on the satellite is, is predicated in the method that our goal is to develop algorithms such that we can um, comfortably rely upon those satellite observations. You are quite right that in regions without aeronet measurements that we are relying more heavily upon characteristics of the algorithm that would translate in space. Uh, and do I see a problem with that? Uh, no, I think that's what the satellite is designed to do. I think what it does beckon is that when there are differences that occur, then it behooves us to understand why those differences are occurring and develop algorithms that can best represent what we think is the true state of the um, relationship between solar backscatter, which is what is measured by satellite, and aerosol optical depth, and subsequently PM2.5. So I'm going to say I, yeah, and then I, 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 um, my name is Bianca Kim. I'm working for Georgia APD. Um, I can share one piece of information, I guess, then, then I have a question. Um, one piece of information is that now I believe the national wide that our agency kind of start work, um, thinking and working on the, um, some differences that we have seen for the FRM versus FPM, the continuous monitor especially when the organic compound, organic com poor carbon pollution is higher, like a wildfire impact days and things like that. And that has an implication for the regulatory, um, I guess the purpose too. But at the same time, if you have been using data fusion based on FRM data, then you probably see some kind of bias um, when you com start comparing the F uh, FEM data sets, especially the continuous monitors. So you might probably start looking into that too, if you're, Past data set is completely based on FRM monitors. Um, I don't know what the direction, what direction that we will end up in, but you know, that's a piece of information that I can share now. And it's just struck me the question that I may be addressed in somewhere else, but uh, do you know any study that actually compared the Aeronet side by side with the uh, um, mass based filter or, or filter based or continuous monitor that's actually measuring mass concentration, kind of see actual um, differences between the methodology other than uh, comparing actually satellite with the ground mind, ground monitor result. Yeah, that's that's a great question. And so the difference between Aeronet, which is a columnar measure, it's a sun photometer that is observing the sun and using uh, that observation of the sun to infer the aerosol optical abundance or aerosol extinction within that column, that's very different than a mass-based measurement. And what I would hope is that there could be an increase in co-location between the sun photometer network and ground-based PM2.5 mass measurements that would give us a direct measure of the relationship of aerosol optical depth to PM 2.5. Uh, there is one network, Spartan, that, that is uh, working towards that goal, uh, but it's an ambitious goal that I think would benefit from additional resources in that space. Thank you. Um, my question is also for Randall. So, uh, you know, just building on what was the previous question about regions of the world that have fewer monitors, there is a lot of 
activity in setting up low cost monitoring stations in those, you know, exactly those types of places. And in looking ahead, where do you see the role of those monitors in the global data sets that we have been using for those broader burden assessments? And then related to that, um, you know, the second question that always comes up is about composition. And I know Maya is going to try and, um, you know, start addressing pieces of it. So again, looking ahead to where we might be going, global understanding of chemical composition of PM at you know, at a scale that we can use for burden assessments, where where are we in that process, and you know what might be looking at um, over the next few years? Yeah, Pallavi, those are challenging questions. Uh, uh, really insightful. So, uh, the first one on low cost monitors, right? This is a, a large activity space. Um, my impression on where they could contribute to the specific question that we're asking, and there are many others examining other aspects of, of questions related to low cost monitors, is understanding the spatial heterogeneity in PM in populated regions uh, where there is a um, reference monitor that can be used to ensure that the low cost monitors are reporting that same values, so, sorry, that, that we can leverage the precision of the low cost monitors by the accuracy of a reference monitor. And that will then enable better characterizing what air spatial gradients. I feel that that is a, a real uh, measurement gap, especially at the global scale. Your second question on composition. So uh, that's an even more challenging one. So the map that I showed about the absence of, of mass monitoring in most of the world is exacerbated and here perhaps a factor of 100 of 100 I don't really know what the abundance of composition monitors is off the top of my head but they are far far fewer than mass monitors and therefore I think that a real challenge is uh, it developing skill in models in representing chemical composition and then having sufficient data to confront those models to uh, assess their uh, efficacy in representing that composition. Maya will be a source of information. I hope that we can continue to add uh, PM 2.5 chemical composition measurements. I think that will be of immense value. And there are still other platforms as well that are of immense value, such as aircraft. Can I just, like, just to kind of also direct to some of our other panelists, um, Curious to hear from the air managers on the panel about the role that low cost sensors is or isn't playing mm. in your in your sort of jurisdictions right now, and if you are expanding the role or how just kind mm. of how that comes into play as you're integrating different data sets. Um, I so for our states, there are some efforts in the low cost sensor communities. Um, specifically, in thinking about environmental justice communities, um, this is a really big. Uh, push the last couple of years. Um, and moving forward, um, if you were paying attention in the first session with the crossover between NACA uh, and Haycast, uh, my boss, Paul Miller, asked the question of what kind of initiatives might be available based off of, or what kind of collaborations we could develop with the, um, inner, the um, IRA funding that has become available. And I think some of that could draw in with low cost sensors uh, and tying that in maybe with some of the things that Randall was talking about. Um, so from the TCEQ standpoint from Texas, um, my group doesn't is not in the monitoring part of it. So I can't be specific about it. I know that there's been some, some interest and in some evaluation of monitors. I know that resource constraints are um, a, a concern th throughout our agency in terms of we have to do the federal reference method monitoring first and meeting all those requirements has been a, a relative challenge in, in the past few years. So um, I guess I, I don't know in terms of uh, where the agency is going to go in that. There are other groups within Texas uh, for sure that have been deploying purple airs, other things uh, in, in some of the urban areas. And so those are out there and within analysis projects, we've looked at those um, a little bit. And I think, you know, trying to take some of our um, monitoring and using that to sort of bring confidence into the spatial gradient from some of these low cost sensors uh, would be a good thing. And, and we know that EPA has also been 
looking at uh, sensors throughout the country as well and doing tests. So um, it's coming, you know, it's out there certainly, and and we're going to use them more. But from Texas's standpoint, I think that we're still we're still diving in a little bit. We're going to turn to an online question. Yes, we have a question from the chat. This is for Doug Boyer. Do you use satellite data to help identify and assess non-attainment areas? I saw a handful of SO2 non-attainment areas in your map. Do you envision some additional areas with potential SO2 issues appearing once Tempo is making observations? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the the non-attainment areas thus far have been uh, determined from uh, regulatory mon or monitoring. So it, it is not from satellite, the, that data, uh, the satellite data can be used within our demonstrations and, and analysis purposes. Um, the specific SO2, sulfur dioxide non-attainment areas were from monitors put out recently around um, specific sources. And, and those were uh, carbon black plants or um, coal-fired power plants, things like that, that, that had uh, larger SO2 emissions. And so that's how those were, were defined through, through uh, the processes there. Um, in the future, I think that Tempo and other things are going to be very powerful in providing us more information. Um, thus far, the non-attainment designations have not been based on that. So we can keep the discussion going. So I'm going to use this opportunity that nobody can, Andreas, to jump in again. Sorry. And a question for Ted. I was curious, um, since you pointed out the discrepancy potentially with the Atlanta airport, mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you, like, and maybe from that, the question is, do you think this could be something systematic that we're underestimating emissions from airports kind of everywhere or... I think um, the answer is yes. I think there, that could be systematic. And I also, I would actually say, um, this is another case where the model is getting this NO to NO2 ratio wrong, just because it's a, um, it's a pretty dense source region and the models are over diffusing. And it doesn't take, take off to, it doesn't take that much for that ratio to be off. And we've looked at some of the ground-based monitors uh, that do give you NO and NO2. And there, that ratio is a little off uh, in the ground-based monitoring too. And we just haven't gotten to that step to really do that, um, that further piece of analysis. So I think it is can be systematic. Um, and it also did get worse when we added the upper level. Um, you know, the, the NEI only goes up to some level and then we added emissions on top of that from essentially the geoschem modeling. And so that does impact it as well. But yeah, so the answer is yes, I think it can be. So systematic NOx emission underestimate and the ratio of the under No, it's a systematic getting more NO2 to NO I than is okay. actually in the observations at the ground level. Okay. Um, just because it's fundamentally, you know, diffusing, yeah. actually it's diffusing the ozone down too fast is really it. So that you don't get as much, um, titration or yeah, yeah. The way you're getting the titrations just uh right at the ground you're getting uh too much actually interesting um speaking of non-attainment areas my home of fairbanks alaska when i moved there 30 years ago they had wintertime non-attainment for carbon monoxide from cars that is no longer a problem not because well, it's because fuel injection has come along and the old cars are off the road. And so carbon monoxide in Fairbanks in the winter in that surface inversion is no longer a problem. Ted, your talk on the Air Atlanta airport was really striking. And I keep, one of my pet peeves is, is there a technology that can make airplanes more efficient, like electric wheels, instead of having to use the jet engines to get around on the tarmac? The airports do use them. You can electrify the ground-based uh, equipment. You know, the, right now, they, most of the airports will still, still use um, essentially um, diesel tugs to move their, their, uh, the airplanes, and then they'll let them taxi out more. You can electrify those, those sources. There's a lot of sources you can, you can electrify, and that will help. And you can make it so that 
they use they don't rely so much on the jetons themselves. So if you look at it, actually LAX has moved that direction. They they have they're implementing more more things to reduce the emissions associated with the airports. Just because you know they've had a lot longer that they've been trying to deal with it and going a lot further. So there are there are technologies to do that. When it comes to the jet engine, um, you know they continue to look for lower emission engines, but that's that'll be tougher than some of these other other approaches. From a control technology perspective, uh, VOCs in particular, um, it was mentioned uh, in this session earlier that uh, implementing policy to support control technologies with VOCs uh, is exponentially easier when we can target specific VOCs. And with the extensive list of them that are out there and the vast differences between different study areas and different locations, uh, what's the first step in singling out the VOCs that are of concern for your particular study area uh, and or problem? Uh, I guess I can go first. So there's a couple of ways that you can kind of tackle that. One is, would you first just try to implement over a broad area or a, sp a very localized area that you would attempt to implement these VOC reductions. And then the other is thinking about um, which, v you know, if there's a class of VOCs that you could target and thinking about uh, ways to accomplish that by understanding their ozone production efficiency. Um, so in, in coming up with a solution, yeah, I think there's a couple of ways that you can approach that as far as actually getting there. I don't know if I have a good example, but those are kind of the 30,000 foot questions. Yeah. So uh, one example that I can give is, is in the Houston area. Um, previously, uh, through field campaigns and other things, there was a, a lot of measurements taken on on VOCs. And uh, like Alex said, you can look at the reactivity of those individual VOCs. They did the VOC canisters, other things. Um, and there it was found that uh, you mentioned propylene, ethylene, uh, one three butadiene. We, we call these highly reactive VOCs in, in terms of uh, the Houston area or Texas's ozone formation. And so um, in the early 2000s, those specific VOCs were targeted. And so the abundance of those and the ability to rapidly create ozone um, was one reason that they were sort of targeted. And so you could do that if you have um, speciated VOC measurements in, in your area of interest and, and see what's uh, the most reactive in terms of ozone formation. So that's one way you can go about it. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, so my name is Langston Verdeen. I'm uh, uh, with a, a project called Breathe Smart Wisconsin. I'm not a scientist. Be honest, a lot of stuff I'm learning a ton, but 50% is right. Um, I'm wondering though, and where I get excited is knowing more about what excites you all about this work, where your work is headed, like what do you see as exciting, but also, you know, how others may use your work to, to create change. I mean, what, what kind of excites you about the work that you're doing right now? I will start out and just say, <laughs> maybe this comes from being the old guy in this room, is that one of the most exciting things is to see how much air quality has improved and it continues to improve yeah it's not improving quite as fast now because we've sort of done a great job so far but it i would say actually what excites me continue uh further is we are still you know we're making a big difference in people's health that's bottom line is it's we're we're seeing those change those um improvements to continue, you know, we're, we're doing it. Uh, so I think that's the most exciting piece is just, uh, we've seen great benefits and we're continuing to see them. And actually I, I will say one of the other things, we worked a lot with foreign students, uh, seeing the, the impact we're making on other countries. So that probably a very different driver than others, but that's it. We can go down the line, I guess. It, it, 
I, I'll second what Ted said, just, you know, how, how things have been improving. Um, you know, I've been at this for, for 20 plus years in, in Texas and, and seeing the spe specifically ozone concentrations decrease. But also with that, it's like we've had this increased resolution on things too, not, you know, with our modeling, like I was showing, it's like things are getting finer, but it's the same thing with the satellite data. And you talk about low cost sensors, you can put those in a lot more places and it's informing, I think, so many more people in terms of air quality. And, you know, another ambassador was uh, the Prism brizometer or brizometer, I forgot how you say it, but you know, that that's coming to people's phones now. And that's basically because of the work that this type of community does in terms of modeling and monitoring and, and trying to bring outreach and, and scientific communication. So that's exciting for me to see. Uh, I wanna talk about a couple of things. And so first is my personal favorite uh, uh, and the thing that drives me are, is doing um, really unrealistic sensitivity scenarios in modeling. Um, so like 90% reduction of on-road vehicles. Um, it's not going to happen tomorrow. Maybe it'll happen. Maybe it'll happen in my lifetime. Who knows? Um, but uh, using model simulations to uh, try different flavors of extreme policy changes that, you know, are very hypothetical. Um, the thinking about end users. So I mentioned that we ran, uh, that the Ozone Transport Commission ran an extensive um, source apportionment uh, analysis. I think it had something like 400 different tags that were either state specific or sector specific or region specific. Um, and what that can help our states understand are what is the next like lowest hanging fruit, like to Ted's point that you know, air pollution isn't declining as rapidly as it once was. So how can we use models to inform that, you know, what's what's that next um, item on the to-do list that we can try to address because it's the biggest contributor, because it's the easiest contributor to um, make some kind of changes to. And then finally, touching on satellites, this again is a kind of coming back to a personal exciting thing. I have been excited for Tempo to launch since I was an undergrad. And so I'm finally happy that it's, it's you know, we're so close to it happening um, and that I'm actually back in the uh, a space where I can use those data. So I'm looking forward to that eventually. Yeah, I guess the last in the line, I, I, um, I'm excited about the progress that has been made in information availability worldwide. So uh, as an example, when an early assessment of the global burden of disease went out, prior to the availability of satellite observations to contribute to that assessment of PM2.5, that the estimate of PM2.5 was made from an econometric model that was used to look at the relationship between a given level of economic activity in PM2.5 and then extrapolated worldwide. And uh, that's really um, been a very different outcome. Our understanding then of the burden associated with PM2.5 has really changed once there has been satellite observations that uh, offer uh, measurement-based information about uh, the distribution of PM2.5. Another example that I'd refer to is our ability to understand the reasons behind uh, the ambient concentrations that exist. I can recall 20 years ago, uh, conducting uh, simulations um, or hearing about simulations uh, with uh, an office mate, for example, uh, uh, just trying to understand in basic, basic questions whether it would be lightning or whether it was uh, some biogenic source or anthropogenic source, very, very crude scale understanding of what's contributing to ambient concentrations. And I feel that our state of knowledge has progressed immensely in being able to apply models to characterize the role of sources in their um, in ambient concentrations. And that really then uh, provides for more informed decision making. And I find that super exciting. Great. Is there one? I think we could squeeze in one more question if anybody has one. I want to thank everybody for a really stimulating discussion. It was great to have time for discussion and to, to um, 
get to hear all of these different perspectives. And so thank you very much for participating in the session. And I think it's, we have a break? Yep, 15 minute break before the next one. Okay. Thanks, everyone.